So I want to talk to you. A lot of times Christians, our eyes slip off of, of being heavenly minded and being earthly to earthly mindedness. Discernment and judgment. All right? So we're going to look at two words. First of all, the Bible says in Matthew 7, verse 1, 2, and 3, that we're not to judge one another, right? Because if we judge another, then we'll be judged in the measure that we judge. Now, let me share with you. That's really hard in our day and age because we need to judge what is right or wrong. This brings in the second word. Everyone say discern. So judge is crino, K-R-I-N-O, and discern is diacrino, which means to discern. So you cannot judge or pass a sentence on someone and think in your mind that's the way they are. What if they're not that way? And if we pass a sentence on somebody and think they don't deserve anything, God always deserves to save them. Can you say amen? So we're forbidden to pass a sentence or to opinionate somebody and say they are this way when they might not be that way at all. But we can discern, hello, and not judge what to eat, what to listen to, friends to have. So God wants us to have the ability to discern good from evil, but not to pass a judgment on others, especially children of God. So let's get into our lessons together. All right. We've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. And we're doing a deal on prayer. So we're going to talk about the prayer of faith. What the prayer of faith really is. How many know without faith we cannot please God? Amen. So we're to trust and we're to believe in the Lord. So good morning to you. I'm going to read you my paragraph. Blessings to you. We are learning about how God is beginning to do things in our life and how to put our trust in him. And then the results that we get are exactly what he designed for us to get. Today we're going to learn how to pray the prayer of faith, what it means and what it does. Everyone that's a Christian can pray the prayer of faith. Well, Pastor Kerry, I thought every prayer should be done in faith. Yeah, that's correct. But the prayer of faith is a special way in which God reaches those that don't have any faith. It's one of the touchy-feely ways in which we can get people who can hardly believe in God to receive healing. Everyone say, thank you. God has made a way in every way to try to reach somebody that's lost. So God is always fair and he's always just. So the prayer of faith is just that. It's a means whereby we can be healed, we can be saved, we can be cleansed all through the prayer of faith. So we're going to get into that and we'll have a great time. Can you say amen? Let's go ahead and read our, our benefit scriptures. This is the problem with a lot of us as Christians. I mean, all of us. Notice I included myself. That we forget at times. We have to have the word before us to remind us. So Psalms 103, 1 through 5 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. What are we to do? Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his. Yeah, all the New Testament benefits. Rehearse them. Study them. They are yours. Don't let the devil keep you from them. Who forgives how many of your iniquities? Who forgives all of our iniquities? Who heals how much of your diseases? All of your diseases, poor, who crowns your life with loving kindness. In other words, he's tender, and his tender mercies, verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things. That's why God doesn't want you speaking negative, speaking against others. You satisfy your mouth with good things. Speak those. As you sow, so shall you reap. So shall you reap. So that your youth is renewed like the what? All right, so let's go over five again. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So something about the way we praise and thank and with our mouth will cause us to be younger and renewed like an eagle. Wow. So these are principles that we need to keep in practice. These are things given to us from God so that we can make our way through this darkness. How many here know the world is a fallen world? It has a, a, a team of darkness. John says, love not the world. Neither the things in the world say amen. Why? Because with everything that we toy around with the world, the enemy tries to make a price in it. Let's make a deal. I'll trade your salvation for what's behind curtain number three. Five million dollars. You don't want to save? You don't want to get rid of your salvation for five million how about over here? For, see, that's what he does. And remember, we learned last week that he uses baubles. The devil uses a lot of flashy flash and bobby bobbies and little things like a little rattle does to a child. A little baby doesn't know anything about a rattle. But if you handle the rattle right, you can draw that child's attention to the rattle or something that gets their eye. It's bobbly, it's whippily, whoopily. That's how Satan works. God does not... Put a carrot in front of you and try to lead you on some kind of endless journey, hoping that it's going to come together. That is not how your father treats you. Say, I needed to hear that. If you ever get in a situation where everything just seems out of reach, you go to God and say, why is it out of reach? Don't chase the bunny. You might fall in the hole. <laughs> we don't want you to do that. Can you say amen? All right. We're going to cover these four things. You taking notes? Number one, we're going to say to you, and we're going to encourage you, that every bit of your prayer, especially the prayer of faith, is based on covenant benefits. Everyone say covenant benefits. Forget not all his benefits. For example, Christians, because they don't have the word in front of them, how many years ago was healing established for us? Over 2,000 years ago. And who established our healing? Jesus. Who established our salvation? Jesus. So healing's already there. So it isn't a question of you getting God to heal you. It's a question of you receiving the healing that's there. So that's where I come in to teach you how to apply the word so that you and the Holy Spirit can get all the benefits. Can you say amen? Well, did you know in that, forget not all those benefits, one of the things about salvation means that he protects you. Here's one that Christians don't realize. Because they, their eyes have slipped and because they're involved in the affairs of the world, they think God is somehow in some kind of deal working out something with them. What a confusing mess. God does not operate that way. Hello? That's not God. That's not the Father. We need to lift our eyes and pay attention to Jesus so he can lead us out of the messes. Can you say amen? Amen. And then if we don't get let out and we get caught up, guess what? The enemy will keep you from church. You'll always have problems. You'll never get a victory about this. You'll always be hopeless. That's the enemy. Snip him out. <laughs> Recognize him. God has a discernment shield on you. Did you know how many here are covered with the armor of God? 
When you got born again, you got the armor. The armor's never left you. But it becomes dim or bright depending on your walk with God. Are you close to God? Do you meet with God on a daily basis? It's going to be bright. It's going to push the enemy away. But when you are just doing your thing and getting caught up in the world and getting full of cares and all these worries, and your armor dims. And the enemy goes, oh, that's scary. Let's get him. I know all the temptations to carry. And so he runs what we call algorithms on you. He knows all of your past, but he doesn't know your future. We know our past, and we don't know our future, but who holds our future in his hands? Yeah, that's right. So we go to him every day for him to reveal the steps of tomorrow. Say amen. That way tomorrow has victory already in it because we walk with whom? Almighty God. Can the devil get in his camp? No, the devil can't get into God's camp. And you're a child of God. What happens is he calls us out of God's camp into our own thing. We get to worrying. We get to doing this and all that kind of stuff. Now we're caught up in the net. And oh God, oh God, help me, help me. And God says, okay, be still. Know that I'm God. So you don't drown yourself in your panic. Relax. Now, I want to tell you a quick story. I get cramps every once in a while on my legs. Maybe you do too. But, you know, being only have one leg, so it's only one leg. <laughs> and they're at night, and boy, they hurt. And God gave me a word. I mean, this is how much he loves us. God told me, he says, son, you want to learn how not to feed that cramp and cause you to have stand up and wait a half an hour for it all to go away? I says, yeah. He says, when you feel it coming on, just relax your foot. That's not what you want to do. You want to tighten up and tense up. No, relax your foot. And as soon as I obeyed him, it works every time now. And I'm talking about two or three times a week, a, a massive cramp. I don't know how my wife could, could sleep through the night. It's, it must be the armor. Anyway, you follow what I'm saying? Well, it's that way with our walk. We, our life cramps up and everything because our eyes are not fixated. And all of a sudden, you find this confusion, this different stuff you feel. Don't panic. Stop. Retune. And watch God go. And it moves it right out of the way. It's like releasing of the cramp in my leg, if you can relate to that. You see, it's the panic. It's, it, it's the freaking out that the devil loves. You're so concerned about everything else except for how to have peace and walk and rest. Say amen. And you're learning. That's the greatest thing. So we'll cover these things. The, everything's based on our covenant benefits. The prayer of faith, we're going to cover what it is, how it works. Three, cast not away your confidence. You got to have confidence in who you are in God. Say amen. And then fourth, examples of this kind of prayer. We're going to pull out of the book of Acts a couple of examples of the prayer of faith, okay? All right, so let's get into it. The covenant and its benefits. Go with me to Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. Pour myself some grape juice. I always joke about I haven't done this in a long time. You get a little cup for communion. I no, <laughs> no. I this is. I've had a couple extra of these, and these are really nice to sip on, especially with me. I get a little bit of congestion in my throat when I talk, you know, and that just cuts it right out, you know. It's kind of like Paul writing to Carrie, me, and says, "Take a little bit of grape juice for your throat <laughs> instead of for your stomach, Timothy." If you don't read your Bible, you won't understand what I just said. All right, here we go. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded. Who is he talking about? Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes or bruises, we are what? Notice it didn't say, you're going to be healed. Now, this was written over 700 years ago in the Spirit of God. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. So how many know that God backs his word? 
So he just tells us that Jesus is going to pay all of our meal ticket. He's going to pay for our life. He's going to pay for our healing. He's going to pay for our salvation, Becky, our soundness of mind. He's going to pay for all of those things. And all we have to do is go to him for those and believe we receive them just like he asked us to, and he'll work it out. Can I tell you something that's been happening to me? I've been spending more time with God, and you know, I'm, and I'm able to do that, and I, I praise the Lord, and not in comparison. Something is happening to me. My physical body is changing. I can, I can literally hear in the spirit so clearly, but let me, let me tell you some of those strange things. I, and I don't blame it on a physical. Not, there's no physical answer for this. I can look at a pepper and I can actually start sweating. I can touch a pepper without getting in the juices and everything, and I can feel. I can, I can touch things and smell the scent of them. So it, it seems like my senses, what I'm saying, is, are becoming keen. I don't know how to say that. More like they were supposed to be when we were first created. And I know how to explain it. The taste of food, the different things, I can discern by the sense of smell and different things that I never could do before. My wife would tell you, I can look at a bowl of peppers and start sweating. And there was something else, too. Knowing things before they happen. Many times during the day, I'll see something happen, then it'll happen. See something happen, then it'll happen. See something happen. And I went to God about this, and I said, God, what's going on? He says, I'm getting you ready for a prophetic ministry to move in the prophetic realm. And in order to do that, I've got to strip off your old man so it doesn't get in the way when you want to be used by me. I thought, wow, Lord, and the sensitivity is I want you sensitive because there's a lot of deception out there. And you need to be able to discern good from evil. Now, see, I do a lot of studying. I call it studying on your behalf. I have to study in areas like... Uh, that you might not even consider, and I'm, I don't want you to look into them. But I'm looking into all this weird stuff that's happening around us because it's very rule, it's very crucial. This is, again, this is the end time, so we need to be really in tune with God. Say amen. So I want to tell you that if you're consistently with God, you're being consistent with him, will completely quicken your body and get it young like an eagle's. And it's happening to me. I don't, I'm not doing it. I'm not eating anything different or anything special. In fact, I'm a little bit more sleepier, less, less sleep than I've been having. But, it, but it's only because we had to advance forward for spring. Spring forward. I'm just joking. But no, I get rest and everything. But the keenness of the spirit, God does that. You get in there. Let me just encourage you. And God begins to do things with you, and man, remember, it's you and God's personal walk. Then it reaches out to others. Hey, and if you're out of tune, you're going to be the crabbyizer instead of the blessyizer. Can you say amen? All right. So go with me to 1 Peter 2.24. We just got through reading Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. And the last part of that says, by his stripes we're healed. And then it says... All we have like sheep have gone astray and have turned away from him who called us or made us. Amen. Like sheep, they're scattered. Now, 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who himself, talking about Jesus, bore our own sins in his own body on the tree. Who sins? Our sins. Notice the word sins it has an S on it. So what is that? Sin with a singular is the nature of sin. Sin with an S means the fruits of people sinning, okay? The sins, okay? So it reads basically this, For our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sin, still with an S on that, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. How many years ago? Over 2,000 years ago. So healing is just there. Now, what would you do if you go to a restaurant and your favorite meal I, they've always had, but then you show up and they look at you and they go, well, we don't have that anymore. Well, 
God wants you whole, but he doesn't want you healed. We don't have that anymore. You see, that's not true. Can you say amen? If I take you out, Piggy, and I pay for your meal, and pay for your lunch and everything, and pay the tip and everything, are you going to have to pay? Okay. If Jesus paid for our healing, our salvation, our wholeness, our soundness, our protection, are we going to have to pay for anything? No, it's by grace we receive it, right? By grace we walk in it. And by grace we love God in it. But it's by God's help we can walk in it. Can you say amen? Because we can't do it on our own. How many years tried to be good? Used to tell my dad, Dad, I tried to be good. He says, well, how'd that work out for you? Can you, can you say amen? So he took, paid the price for our whole life. So guess who owns us? If you really think about it legally, we need to let God own and protect us and care for us. Say amen. That doesn't mean we don't work. That doesn't mean we don't pray for our children. doesn't mean all that. It means that we submit to God so he can care for us in all that we do. Can you say amen? Man, I tell you what, I worked a job really hard, and that was good. Then I worked a job really hard with Jesus helped me, and that was really better. Always bring God in everything you do because it would be like you're lost somewhere without a shepherd. If you don't keep close to God, you will be sucked away. Look at how many Christians I know here just recently have dumped their wife and dump their lives to go chase some little doll that's a hot little honey. Now, won't you say, I would say that was kind of a, a lustful thing. Yeah, yeah, not good. Why? Because they don't have any foundation nor treasure their relationship with God. So it's easy for them to give things up they don't value. Do you value your walk in God? Do you value what Jesus went? All of your prayers, all of our asking, all of what we do is based on what Jesus, Jesus has done. It's called his finished work. Everyone say, Jesus' finished work. A couple points I'm going to give you. Church, our salvation and complete restoration is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We just have to meet with him consistently so he can build it back in our life. Say amen. He'll quicken you. Two, our complete life has been paid for. An established package has been placed into our spirit with every benefit that pertains to life and godliness. Can you say amen? You find that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Thirdly, Jesus established the word forever. So healing's already established. The fact that whether we get it or not depends on our faith. Hello, whether we believe it or not, trust God for it or not. Say, oh, me, somebody. Oh, me, somebody. All right, very good. And then fourthly, church, if, if you're having trouble believing and receiving, all of us do at times, Jesus will even help us with this. You got to go to him, though. You have not because you ask not. Well, I don't want to bug God. He's busy. Listen, if you can't, your life, if everything, let me see if I can describe it in a positive way. A lot of times people's lives are broken. They see problems. They have no solution or answer. And you see, they'll stay in that condition because their eyes are on that condition. Where are we to look? Up. From whence cometh our help. And we need to lift up and then begin to love and worship on God so that all the channels open up and he can help us and tell us what to do, how to walk, how to get out of that mess. But, oh, no, I'm feeling sorry for myself. I haven't got time to listen to God, you see. And we do that. That kind of person, which we've all been in a time or two, needs to die away. Can you say Amen. Have you ever, I don't know about you, but I was one of those kids that if I saw something at the store, I'd cause a fit to get it. I mean, no, that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> well, listen, listen. That's the enemy. 
He hasn't got your attention, so what does he do? He tries to stir up something over here, something over there, something here just to get you to look around and everything. No, you just keep going to God and say, give me your wisdom, give me your knowledge, I'll order my steps, Lord. I just love and appreciate you. Guess what? You're keeping yourself in him so that he maintains a good maintenance program on his child. Can you say amen? Now, if you're wandering away all the time, then you're going to get damaged because you're out of the protection. We've already found out that everybody that's born in the earth has a hedge about them. Then they get to the age of knowing right from wrong. Then they tear down their hedge from the inside out. Then we get born again. Then God puts another hedge around us. Then he puts angels over us. And he gets all that going. But if we don't discipline our words and our judgments and all that kind of stuff, we'll begin to tear it apart from the inside out. Because we're the only ones that can. Do you think the devil can tear your heads down? Not at all. He can't even approach you when that head's built. But we don't stay consistent and keep the maintenance of our life together. Hello? And we, we need help to do that. Say, and I'm not claiming this for you. So we have to get better at it. Say amen. And the more consistent and better you become, the more your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Moses started his ministry at 80. Abraham, at 133, his wife is long gone. He's sitting there laying on his deathbed. You might like this. And he sees Isaac with his new wife. And they're just kissy, huggy, sloppy face. I'm sure that's what's going on. He gets all excited, gets married again, has more children. Instead of lying down and dying. I think a lot of people lay down and they give up. Don't you do that. And if you know somebody that's done that, encourage them to get up. Why are you hearing this message? Because you're guilty of these things? No. So you go out there and help somebody's life. Can you say amen? Amen. So all of the benefits are based on the covenant, and we should be able to receive them. Say amen. And the only one that's keeping you from being totally made well is the devil working with your flesh. So everyone say, thank God I don't walk in the flesh, I walk in the spirit. Amen. So let's go on to point two. I've got to turn my page and it's stuck together. Who's spilling stuff on my page, honey? All right. The prayer of faith. Now there's some beautiful nuggets in here, so I want to take the time with you on this. So go with me to James chapter 5 in verse 13 through 16. Okay, James chapter 5, 13 through 16. This is the body of Christ, and this is how it functions. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him what? Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. If your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. If anyone's suffering around you, let him pray. So don't complain, pray. <laughs> Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Give ear to my words. Oh, like, like we have praise and worship. Get caught up in it. Are you cheerful? Be thankful. Say amen. Let him sing praises. Verse 14, is any among you sick? That happens. Let him call for the older people of the church, the elders of the church. Some people only see offices. But really an elder is anyone that's been saved over a length of time that got themselves seasoned and know how to pray the prayer of faith. That's basically all an elder is because every church is not the same. We're all smaller or larger on the other. I, I have elders, but not here today. We're not big enough, okay? So when we get big enough, we'll have elders and people operate in, in administration and stuff. That's good. But call for the older people of the church that know how to pray. Don't call for the young baby that'll sit with you in the mass and go, yeah, I had this happen to me too. <laughs> God doesn't want you to give them empathy. He wants you to pray over them and love them. Say amen. So let's read what it says. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Pray over him. 
anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save, deliver, heal, make whole, and preserve the sick. That's what that word save means. And the Lord will raise him up. See, this requires no faith of the person that's sick. It requires faith of the elders. They pray over him, and the prayer of faith shall save, heal, deliver, make whole the sick. Now, it doesn't stop there. Then we step back, and God raises that person up. Now, that is pretty basic. You don't have to grunt your faith to get him to get up. You don't have to coerce. He just, God starts, and if they don't get up, They've made their choice not to get up. That is none of your business. You prayed the prayer of faith over them. God came in on the scene. He will heal them. He will deliver them. Okay? And he will do something else that kind of blew my mind. If there was any sins that caused the sickness or illness, God will forgive it and completely reduce it to nothing. So let's finish the scripture. This is just so good. Listen to this. This is grace plus grace. Can you say? Amen. And it says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he have committed sins, the practice of the sin nature, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses. Wrong. It should say, Confess your light faults. Now, I've had, I had a guy one time, and just so you can laugh at me. He thought that everybody should confess their secret sins all the time. So he started a men's ministry. <laughs> and the first book he got him is My Pornography Habit. I thought, you just slap these guys. Everybody has struggles with stuff. You don't hit them with the problem. Jesus never did. He gave them the healing. Can you say amen? And I wanted to tell you, people's idea of ministry is I'm going to see that your life becomes good if I even die doing it. Well, that's not my business. My business is to pray for you and put you in God's hands all the time. Pray for you and put you in God's hands. Not to tell God how to run your life. Can you say, amen, pray for me, pastor, because I'm going to stick God's goodness on you. So the prayer of faith will save the sick, and if there be any sins, it will be forgiven. Confess your little faults one to another. For example, you know I don't read my Bible as much as I really should, guys. Pray for me that I do. That's what he's talking about, surface things. You know, I, 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 I'm kind of really troubled about a few things. Would you pray me? You don't even have to tell them. These are faults. I'm a, I run a little short. I'm real, you, know, you know, these are faults. Don't sit around and talk about it all the time. Well, when, when a person that's sick and now is receiving healing, they need to be able to open up and say, you know, I was screaming at my wife and I was really upset at my kids and I got this sickness on me. I'm really sorry about it. You see, God sets the whole atmosphere up through the prayer of faith. Everyone say, I got it. Do you understand it now? So if there's somebody around, what do you encourage them that's happy? You encourage them to sing. Somebody around that's kind of suffering, going through things, there, encourage them to pray. Come pray with me, you see. Hello. If somebody's sick, call for the elders of the church. Now, maybe you're at camera and you're home because you're not sick. Have you called me? <laughs> Just joking with you. Well, I've called on Jesus. Isn't he enough? Sometimes not. Sometimes you need to feel the hand. You need to hear the prayer of the elder. You need to feel the oil on your forehead. This is for the babies that can't believe. The young ones that need some extra faith. And my faith, your faith is going to make everything, and God's going to make everything come together. Can you say amen? So they feel the hand, hear the prayer, they feel the oil, they confess their faults, and guess what? God restores them. Now, how many times have you blown it, and then you sat around, and you, and you were in that condition for maybe a day or two, maybe a week or two, you don't want to be in a fallen or fleshly condition as a child of God sitting that way any length of time. Say amen. Imagine yourself as you're that little child that always 
seems to fall in the mud puddle. Do you sit in the mud puddle and splash yourself and go, woe is me, I fell in the mud puddle, God doesn't love me anymore? Sounds like an adult, doesn't it? No, they get up right away and run to mommy or whoever can wipe them off. That's how our walk is. You're going to fall many times. Not on purpose because you're going to struggle with things as God helps fine-tune you and tone you up. When you do, just run to God. He'll tune you up. It's no surprise to him. No surprise to God about you. He loves you. Remember, to God, you're just a little infant who likes to jump on with God's lap and play around, kiss his face, and drool on him. That's the Abba Father that you hear about. The feeling that you can get close enough to God where you can feel comfortable to allow him to operate on you. That's what I'm about. I'm here to try to help you to be that way. I encourage you. Scott, the beatings are going to continue until everybody submits. <laughs> See who's listening and who's not. Now Scott's listening, I'm telling you. But I have to tell him because he's perfect. I can talk to him. He has this poker face. Amen. It's really good. All right. Let's, are you with me? So now you know what the prayer of faith is. Do you think you could do it? Somebody's sick. Somebody's a great choice. And you think gather around and pray the prayer of faith? Um, because here coming up next service or so, I mean next week, we're going to lay hands on BJ so she doesn't have problems, and we're going to lay hands on Peggy, and we're going to start singling you out and praying the prayer of faith over you. Would that be good? Amen. So I got to get you prepped. I've got to get you to believe, begin to study about these things. Say amen, because it's not going to do any good. Once I get you healed, you won't stay healed if you don't have any word to support you. You see, I, go to, I went to, when I was younger, a lot of crusades and evangelists, and I noticed that a lot of people get all fired out, all worked up. Oh, revival's happening. But they have no prayer life, no study life of their own. So they go back home and they backslide because there's nothing supporting in their own habit a maintenance program. Are you in your Bible every day? You should be a little bit every day. Are you meeting with God first thing every day? You should be every day. And if you're not doing those, then your walk is going to be a hot, lot different than everyone else's walk. And you might get mad at somebody like me because my life is good. God made it that way. I didn't make it that way. I just kept myself in God's hands. Keep yourself in God's hands. Don't pull away. Don't be pulled away. Point three, cast not away our confidence. Say amen. And we do that by talking problems all the time. Why is it we feel it upon ourselves to criticize this country? Aren't we supposed to pray for it and put it in God's hands? Amen. See, when we criticize something, we just feed the devil. Why do we think it about ourselves that we can mock and make fun of certain, certain things? God doesn't want you... Now, listen to me carefully. God doesn't even want us to do that to the devil. Michael, the archangel, said, I do not rail against the devil... I just simply tell him what God says and he flees. We don't rail on things. We don't mock things because that's the spirit of the Antichrist. For me to laugh at somebody, put them down in my speech is very immature as a Christian. And you, we need to stop that. But you know what? You're not going to get that kind of preaching over the pulpit because it's not a positive message and it doesn't build mega churches. Okay. So I'm not faulting any of that. God wants a lot of people saved. But you have to come and really get close to God for him to fine-tune us, to catch us at our faults, so that we don't choke ourselves to death. Say amen. Look at yourself in the mirror. You know our faults. You know your faults. I don't need to know them. Work with God with him. He'll deliver you out of yourself. Remember, we're coming out of ourselves. We're metamorphosizing. Don't stop now. You haven't arrived. Don't worry. Be happy. You see, eyes on God. God hasn't lost a war. He hasn't dropped a ball. He hasn't freaked out about anything. 
He's trying to get our attention so we can get and sit on his lap and find the peace and the rest that we need. And then when we fight against the enemy, we do it from his throne room. Father, in Jesus' name, now I am before the throne room. Is there any devil up there, Pastor? No devil in the throne room of God. So that's where we pray. So stop thinking the devil's listening to your prayers. Stop thinking he's doing that. No, he's monitoring you, and he's running scenario temptations on you. But don't be a dummy and listen to any of it. Say amen. Cast not away your confidence. Go with me to Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. This is great. By faith, Enoch was taken away that he uh, did not see death. Uh Uh-huh, some of you are going to be raptured. And was not found. Everybody looked for him because God had what? Taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. Let this be your testimony. That he pleased God. Then he says how to please him. But without faith, It's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he's right there, right now, right in the midst of his throne, right there face to face. When you do that, he will reward you. Because what we don't realize is Satan is waiting for us to serve him. Every one of you, he's waiting for you to serve him, the devil. But when you glorify God, when you talk to God like that, man, he is totally going to bless the socks out of you because that tells the devil, you lost, you fool. You're about a short time, you're going to hell. And God's people need to get out there and start saving people from their messes and stuff. And you know what that does? It helps me to get my eyes off of my situations. Hello? Put your eyes on helping somebody, but do it with balance. Say amen. All right. Look what it says. In in, in Hebrews chapter 3, 14, let's go down to, and let's go back and look at that. For we have become partakers of Christ. Have you become partakers of Christ? Look what it says. If we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the what? Into your life into your life. God wants you to slip on. What if the Lord tarries and like a hundred years from now I go on to be with the Lord? Know how many years I add to my life. I don't care. And I want to share also too. God wants us to have a full life. A good life. Say amen. But we can only have that if we listen to him. Because every situation that you might be in now is not permanent. God can change even that and alter around. Can you say amen? Why? Because we trust him. We go through seasons and thoughts and things, but God remains the same. That's why we go to him on a daily basis. He's our standard. He's our wisdom. He's our knowledge. He gives us common sense. Boy, I look out there sometimes and I wonder if people sucked on the wrong thing. It wasn't common sense. That they got. They only got a few cents. Let's move right along. So Hebrews chapter 10 now. Verse 35 and 36. We're talking about casting not away our trust in God. Our confidence in God. Say amen. And verse 35 says. Therefore do not cast away your confidence. Which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, consistency, Sherry. That after you have done, the Greek says done and keep doing the will of God, you may receive the promise. Do you know all the promises of God? How many here believe that God wants you well? Promise. How many here wants God wants you saved? How many here God wants you totally protected? All right, so how come some of those things we don't quite have yet? Because God is working and constructing us to get us to a place of applying the right principles to keep and maintain the right style of life with him. Say amen. How am I doing up there, okay? All right, my wife's looking at me. And I, everything stops. You know, when I, when I look at my wife's face, time stands. 
my, my wife's face, time stands still. Amen. Where was I? No, I'm just, I'm just joking. So, therefore, don't cast away your confidence. All right, a couple of points. Church, we know the greatest key to our spiritual growth is being face-to-face -face with God, spending quality time with Him. Two, this is where we develop spiritually and become stable before the Lord. Three, only through a consistent habit of being with God do we develop the maturity and character of God from within. Say amen. Fourthly, don't be caught up in the affairs of this world, but rather get close and consistent with God so you might have the wisdom and knowledge not only to stay away from that trap, but help others out of it. Say amen. And finally, the, we're going to go through some examples, all right? Now, some of these you know real well. These are examples of the prayer of faith. So I'm going to take a minute, sip. I want you to go with me to Luke chap, excuse me, Mark chapter 2, verses 2 through 12. Remember that song we heard a little earlier? Tear off the roof, the king's in the house. This is an incident where Jesus is in the house preaching. And the people are so packed in there that a woman had watched Jesus for a while and brought one of her friends. They couldn't get in the house. So they broke open a place, put him and lowered him down through the roof. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I'm paraphrasing, trying to make it short. And the, the religious people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes that were there are thinking, who's this that forgives sin? Who can forgive sin but God himself? That's the point. So here's Jesus sitting there and he says, he perceived their thoughts and he said, so you might know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. I say to this one, take up your bed and go home. He took up his bed and he went home. Then he turns and he says, I'm just paraphrasing so we don't take a lot of time reading the scripture on this part. You can look it up a little later if you like. And so then they got even madder. And Jesus said, which is it easier, to forgive sins or to say to this man, take up your bed and go home? Let me ask you, which one's easier for Jesus to say to the guy? Which one is easier for the guy to, to act on? The forgiveness of sin. Taking up your bed, go home is a little tougher because you really have to override and overthink the way you had been to the way God made you. Hello? You did that when you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You literally were transformed, even though you didn't see much outwardly change, maybe. Okay? So he said to this man, you go home. Everybody says, that's troubling. He says that you may know, that you might know, he says, that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. This man is healed. Now, what did Jesus die for? What did he rise again for? Our healing, our soundness, the forgiveness of sin, our pre preservedness, right? Jesus was just stepping into the old covenant and he said, look, I'm coming. Everybody can get their sins forgiven, but they have to ask. You see, you have to ask for your sins to be forgiven. You have to ask to be healed. You have to ask for God to work with you on a daily basis. Otherwise, you'll have to ask tomorrow. You don't ask, God doesn't move. Oh, yes, he does, not on you. Because you would have to trespass if you don't ask him to get involved. God will never trespass your will. This is where Christians are missing it. They prayed once and they say to God, Lord, I prayed, gave my heart to you. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> and that's how they walk. And they're blessed and they're good and they're saved. But they know very little about all the wonderful mysteries and the powers of the kingdom that God wants to take us in. So let's go back to Enoch for just a minute. Did you know that God took him in his, one of his ships and took him to heaven and showed him all these places? 
showed him what the world's going to be like, and it gave him a prophecy that would only come to pass at the end times, the times that you and I are alive. Now, I believe the book of Enoch is not a canonized scripture, but it is a supportive book that can support some scripture. So don't take it like the Bible, but there are things in there that give a little more description or where the Bible just gives us a general overview, but the book of Enoch can give us some details. Tells us how many angels fell, how many of the watchers may, had sex with the women on the earth, what caused all of these ruins and everything. So that's for another sermon. <laughs> Amen. And so if you want to talk about those kind of things and you want to learn, I'll teach you. You want to argue, I won't talk to you. I'm not an arguer. I'm a truth giver. I don't argue over the truth. I already know it. Not all of it. What truth I know. How many know that the truth that you know are you're good at walking in? The truths you don't know, you have to learn to be developed in. Say amen. So I don't know everything, but the truths God worked in my heart, just like he's worked in your heart, you know. That's why it says you shall know the truth. The word there, know, is the word know by experiencing it. See, so we can know by reading about it. We can know by somebody telling us about it. Then we can know by experience it. Say amen. All right. So the prayer of faith. So Jesus, because he can forgive sin, because he has the power to heal, told the man, go home. I'll deal with the Pharisees. Say amen. And so read it a little bit later so that uh, you can cover it all. It's very beautiful. It's in all three, three of the four Gospels, okay? Uh, I think it's Matthew and Luke and Mark. All right, so a couple of points underneath this. Notice that when Jesus saw their faith, see, without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. Jesus has to see your faith. Don't tell me you have a lot of faith. Show God that you believe him by acting on what he says to you. Love others. Pray. Seek God. Come to church. You're doing that. You see what I'm saying? He can see your faith. It's inactive. You see, but the devils believe. They have no faith in God, but they believe in him. So don't tell me you believe if you're not going to live for him. Because you're just a bag full of hot air. Don't do that. Why do you honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from him? We are actors of what's in our heart. We walk it out. And so your life should show your love for God. Say amen. All right. Another point we need to realize is the same power and the covenant that Jesus was acting on and going to fulfill, you and I have in our heart. You have God's covenant and God himself in your heart. The key is learning how to project God. Now, I want to tell you, I've, I've learned a lot of things all these years. One thing I learned you don't do is you don't poke at the devil. Listen, because he pokes back. What do you do, Pastor Kerry? You just shoot Jesus into him. <clears throat> Hello? In Jesus' name. But you don't poke at the devil and you don't rail at him. And you don't do that because the system set up to poke back to you legally. Hello? That's why when the law first came, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Most people didn't understand that. That's because the system of darkness functions that way. So Satan will have somebody do something to you and the first thing you want to do is something back. Now, in the New Testament, that doesn't work. But in the Old Testament, God says, somebody takes your life, you're going to take theirs. Hello? Read it. Thank God we're not in the Old Testament. But you still need to know that there is a blanket of darkness that hides most of the demonic spirits in this earth. They're kept back there, but the only persons that can bring a spirit out of that place is a human being practicing witchcraft and doing things like that. They pull them out. And so some people get oppressed and they get all that kind of stuff. That's where you and I come in. We just see them, we bind them all up, and we put them back in the curtain. That's our job. Notice the first 
words to the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16. Go into all the world and cast out. Come on, Bible students. Cast out the devil. You're going to move into your new house? Cast out the devil. You're marrying a new family member. Your wife that you love, she's got a whole bunch of family. Cast the devil off of them. Now, I'm making it, I'm hamming it up a little bit. But you say, Lord, I, I love my wife, but she, she's got a whole family and the generations before us. So, Lord, in our marriage, we cast all that out and we shield it. So, no, devils get married with us. Think about it. Everywhere you go. Remember, Satan's here, but he's not always here. He's running a program. Everyone says, it's not until I become on fire that Satan tries to throw water on me. If you're no threat to the devil, he's going to leave you alone. You destroy your own self. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Put a little three-year-old in a room. Watch him for about two or three hours. Lots of little toys. and see what he does. Smash, smash, bash, bash. Hello? That's the nature of Satan. That's why we need to be with God all the time. So he keeps us from that nature until we catch, until God grows up in us. And we're able to keep ourselves from the wicked one, and he touches us not. First John chapter 5, I think, verse 18. Are you ready? Let's look at the other one, and we'll be done with you. This is in Acts chapter 9. This is a, a wonderful lady who made purple items. Now, when they made purple items, they, they smashed a worm called a crimson worm, and they got the purple and the blue out of that, the blood of the worm. The worm is a symbol of Jesus, right? So, amen. So look at this. It's so cool. Acts chapter 9. This lady made purple. So to make purple clothing, very hard, very expensive because of that little worm. And it says, but it happened in those days. She became sick and died. And when they washed her, they, they would prepare her for burial. They laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring or begging him not to delay, but come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing tunics and garments, with which Dorcas had made while she was with them. In verse 40, but Peter put them all out. Why did he put them out? Their chaos and their doubt and unbelief. Listen, many times you'll see Jesus moving somebody aside and getting them healed. Because people have a tendency. Professional mourners. Oh, I know you're not dead yet, but let me practice on you. Oh, piggy, I'm so sorry. And they had professional mourners, which they paid to mourn and lament and march them through the street and the dead. Remember, one time they were marching a dead boy through the street, and Jesus told him to stop and said he's not dead, and he gets him up. So they had these weird traditions. So look what Peter did. This is the prayer of faith, folks. And when he come in, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows, so we put them out, and they kneeled down, and what? Now, this is a prayer of faith. Notice he didn't pray over her. He knelt down, and he started praying. I believe he started praying in tongues. Shandalakarabatata needed to start praying, getting himself all built up. Why? Because he's going to command this girl to come back to life, as God has instructed him. And he needs a spirit man built up, so he can release that kind of God. Say amen. Remember, you're a delivery system. You're not the big honcho boo-boo. Okay? You're not buddy boo-boo. Hey, that's a new one. We can start a new series. Wouldn't that be something? Get to church and march all the dingbats around and call them buddy boo-boos. No, let's not do that. Somebody's going to write me on that one. All right. Look what happened. So he knelt down and he prayed. He already got the victory. He already knew what he was about to do. He's going to command the girl to come alive. Watch. And turning to the body, 
He didn't command her. He's talking to her body, which is dead. He said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and she saw Peter sat up. Then, she gave, then he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when she called and all the rest of the saints and the widows and presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, many believed on the Lord. You see, that's who we are. We're carriers of God. Can I tell you a couple of incidents? Three times in my life, God had used me, even before I knew what it was, to raise people from the dead. It's just a part of ministry. It doesn't make anybody special. I'm not special. I'm just your friend and a good, fairly good teacher, okay? I was called to go down to Haiti, and when we went down to Haiti, I went with a bunch of other pastors and friends. We have a house down there that we minister there that's called um, uh, Lighthouse, and Terry and Carrie Nelson are wonderful ministers there. They've been there a long time. Haiti is a real place that could use your prayers. They don't have any medicines down there, so I was, we were called to go our first day to go to a TB hospital, tuberculosis, where people are put and then they just cough themselves to death. Nobody gets out of the hospital. They don't have any medicines for them. It's really a sad state. So Terry says, I'm going to bring you in, Pastor Carrie. I know you got a lot of faith. I'm going to have you preach and I'm going to have you pray over them. Will you do that? Yes. And remember, we have a whole team of 10 plus people. And so I got to preach a little. I got to pray a little. And I already know how, the, how faith works. So I had them pray over me, have them ask Jesus in their heart. We're talking about 300 people. Okay? And so this, I didn't know this. But then I says, I want you to ask Jesus to heal you. And this is what's going to happen. I told them, blah, 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 blah. And remember, I have an interpreter that's talking to them after my words. So we prayed the prayer and everything, and I just left. And all the team are heading back down to the trucks and the cars, and I hear this blood-curdling scream. Oh, God, I just knew something was horrible. So I went over to see, and there's this woman with her dead baby in her arms. I didn't know what to do. I was beside myself. She says, have you ever heard a blood-curdling scream of agony with somebody? Ah. And before I could even think God had a hold of me, I said, give me your, give me your child. And she put it in my hands. And I says, Lord, this child shall live and not die. I don't know why I'm saying that. I heard it in the Bible or some kind of thing. But God has having me do this. And the child woke up, started crying. I said, sure, now nurse him. Walked off. Now, this is how God works. He doesn't want us to get any glory, but he will leave us with testimonies, things to share with others to encourage their faith. So when I got back home with our teams, got back at, at church and everything, I got a call, and it was Terry and Carrie Nelson. They said, you don't believe what happened? Says so besides this little girls you raised from the dead, says everybody in the TB hospital all went home healed. Now I'm thinking, this is how selfish I was. I'm thinking, how come I didn't stick around to see that with myself? Here God did something beyond me and used just simple us. He wants to use you. He wants to help you be used of God. Don't limit him. We might be limited with some of the knowledge we know, but your God is not limited. So if you got something out of this morning, would you give the Lord a big praise and honor? Amen.